It's my great pleasure to introduce Angela Cassie, the Interim Director and CEO of the National Gallery of Canada. Merci beaucoup, David. Um, I just want to echo the thanks to you and to the entire team. You've named everyone else, but I want to also say your name. So thank you for all the work that you've done for this uh, event. Uh, good evening. Welcome, bienvenue. Thank you for joining us this evening for a conversation with Dr. Kenneth Montague about his last book, As We Rise, Photography from the Black Atlantic. Alors, comme on a mentionné, je m'appelle Angela Cassie et je suis la directrice par intérim du Musée des Beaux-Arts du Canada. Et c'est un plaisir, vraiment un plaisir de vous retrouver ici ce soir pour une, euh, une présentation inspirante sur la collection Wedge et la photographie contemporaine noire. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the gallery is situated on the unceded, unsurrendered traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Nous sommes reconnaissantes d'avoir l'occasion de nous réunir sur ce territoire et pour les gardiens du savoir qui nous guident et nous rappellent l'importance, l'histoire et la signification de cet espace et de ce lieu. C'est grâce à eux qu'ils ont assuré la pérennité de ces terres pendant des milliers d'années. Leurs histoires, leurs traditions, leur culture façonneront un avenir et l'avenir du musée pour les générations à venir. So it's not lost on me today that we are here on the eve of the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation in Canada. And as I was reflecting on this acknowledgement of territory, I was thinking a lot about the connection to As We Rise. Black and Indigenous co-resistance and moments of solidarity have and continue to be an important conversation and action as we both consider the impacts of colonialism and white supremacy. So as we move into tomorrow, which is a day to honor the lives lost, the devastation to indigenous communities caused by the Indian Residential School, we really need to consider that this is both a day of mourning and remembrance of immense suffering. We must work together to acknowledge and reckon with the histories of injustice and colonial violences, violence that we are all inheritors of. And so I'm going to encourage us to take a moment of reflection. Um, and I thought I would start by articulating a uh, some language from the final report of Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It reads, together, Canadians must do more than just talk about reconciliation. We must learn to practice reconciliation in our everyday lives, within ourselves and our families, and in our communities, governments, places of worship, schools, workplaces, galleries, museums. That was my addition. <laughs> to do so constructively, Canadians must retain, remain committed to the ongoing work of establishing and maintaining reflect, uh, respectful relationships. So I'd like to um, thank Stephen Loft, who is our Vice President of Decolonization and Indigenous Ways, uh, for reminding me of that quote today. And would just encourage us all just to take a moment of reflection on the eve of this National Day uh, to consider um, going beyond that acknowledgement of territory and the actions that we can all take individually and collectively. Thank you. So as a gallery, as we strive for a future where art has the power to build bridges, deepen connections, and advance a more diverse and equitable society, at the gallery we choose to articulate this through the idea uh, that was uh, actually came from an Anishinaabon word that reminds us that everything and all things are related and inter interdependent. Anne Kose, tout est relié, everything is connected. And so with that, I would like to now um, talk about the connections to the work of Dr. Kenneth Montague. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce him. And I'm using the full bio because it is incredible. Um, and it just um, demonstrates his commitment and leadership to a lot of different um, elements and aspects that have an impact on our cultural life here in Canada. So he is a full-time dentist, as well as a musician, art collector, curator, 
and founder and director of the nonprofit organization Wedge Curatorial Projects. Dr. Montague has been supporting emerging and established African and diasporic artists since 1997. Based in Toronto, Dr. Montague grew up in a Jamaican Canadian family on the border of Canada and the US. His family was one of the first Jamaican immigrants in that community and closely immersed in issues of race and representation. And sometimes it probably wasn't called that at that time either. <laughs> he has served on the Africa Acquisitions Committee at the Tate, the Advisory Board of the Ryerson Image Centre, and the Photography Curatorial Committee of the Art Gallery of Ontario. He is currently an AGO trustee and advisor to the Global Africa Department and received an honorate doctorate from OCAD University in 2016. Now, for those of you who are not aware, aware of the origins of the Wed Wedge Curatorial Projects, the original gallery was in Dr. Montague's home in Toronto, literally wedged inside the hallway of his loft. <laughs> The collection quickly became a well-respected initiative that wedged black artists into a mainstream market and filled a gap in Toronto's art community. And I think the ripples of that have gone way beyond Toronto as well. Today, the Wedge collection has grown to encompass both historical and contemporary photo phot photography, as well as non-photo-based works that challenge notions of representation and identity. So with that, I am thrilled and honored to welcome Dr. Kenneth Montague to the National Gallery of Canada. Please join me in welcoming Ken. How's everyone doing? Great. Yeah, nice to see lots of folks out. Um, I just came in uh, with my family, my wife Sarah and our sons uh, Eli and Theo. And unfortunately, you know, there's an eight-year-old and a five-year-old son, and the five-year-old woke up in the middle of the night. <coughs> you know, so unfortunately, uh, they're they're here, but staying in the hotel. We all tested negative, so that's a good thing. Yeah, um, I. I wanted to uh, really acknowledge, just firstly, just to say thank you to uh, Angela Cassie and her team here, to David Galanders, to the team that worked on this um, uh, presentation tonight. And I just think it's such an important moment um, in, in, you know, in my world of you know, collecting and, and, and celebrating black artists. It's just thrilling to be here at the National Gallery where there's been really uh, a, a very palpable push, you know, to to bring artists uh, that are near and dear to my heart into the mainstream. It's, it's a thrill to walk in and see this beautiful sculpture from Rashid Johnson, who's in my collection and actually has a photograph that's that's in the As We Rise book and an exhibition. So, thank you to all of you, Angela, and to to, to uh, the staff here. Um, I will uh, see if I can just. Uh, move our slides along here, and here we go. Um, the book As We Rise is, is really a, a celebration of works in my wedge collection, and Angela just told you that it literally was, that that word wedge was based on a wedge-shaped hallway that was in a, a loft that I lived in, uh, but it really is a double entendre. It's, it's, it's about wedging artists into the mainstream, into the story of contemporary art. And I think, you know, black artists have been excluded um, and it really, uh, you know, forgotten. I, I tend to not use the word forgotten, but rather excluded because it was a purposeful thing. It was like, you know, this is primitive art or this is art that, you know, doesn't belong on the walls in the galleries that, you know, these mainstream Western institutions had, had sort of organized. And I think that um, my whole ethos around collecting and around, um, you know, bringing these artists together is to share, you know, and, and, and hence this term, uh, As We Rise, which really is a family motto. My, my late father, Spurgeon Montague, uh, often talked about uh, the idea that as we do well, we should lift up others in our community. And, you know, I think this is um, 
kind of the way that I, I collect art too. So we'll talk about that. The book itself um, um, was put out by the Aperture Foundation and that is a remarkable photography uh, organization that's a nonprofit in New York. And they approached me about doing a book uh, maybe a year, two years ago, and the book came out last fall. Uh, one of the people that I was so thrilled to ask to write in the book was Teju Cole, who's a well-known author, um, Nigerian-American author, and also a great photographer. And I just thought I would lead by, you know, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll read this out because I think it's important. Um, I'm showing a slide that is about... Um, kind of condensed from Teju's uh, opening essay in the book. Too often in the larger culture, we see images of black people in attitudes of despair, pain, or brutal isolation. As We Rise gently refuses that. It is not that people are always in an attitude of celebration, that would be a reverse but corresponding falsehood, but rather that they are present as human beings, credible, fully engaged in their world. And I think that really set a tone for the book. That's from the foreword of, of the book about my collection. Um, this is the image, and you know, all these images we're showing will be in the book. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little background. This is an image that I saw as a 10-year-old, and I'm in my late 50s now, so that was a while ago. And uh, that is uh, an image of a couple in raccoon coats with their beautiful Cadillac, with the white wall tires, and they're in front of their Harlem brownstone. And this would be the 1930s, a moment of the Harlem Renaissance. It's an amazing time uh, in America where you know black communities, mainly from the South, had uh, kind of found a certain freedom and uh, ability to have some little moment of leisure time in their lives. And I saw this image when I was 10 years old at the Detroit Institute of Arts. I was born and grew up in Windsor. My parents were Jamaican immigrants. So we, you know, my dad was doing, uh, I think, graduate work in Detroit at the time in education, and my mom would take the three kids over to the Detroit Public Library or to, you know, Detroit Historical Society or to the DIA. And I saw this great image. I remember it was burned in my brain because, you know, I just hadn't seen depictions of black folks, certainly African Americans, like this. I was growing up in an era with television shows like Sanford and Son and, you know, Good Times and stuff you'd see on CHEH now, you know. And, and it's kind of, uh, it was just a, a remarkable thing as a 10-year-old to see an image like this. I just, it, it was very aspirational for me, you know, and hence the As We Rise. It was, it was kind of setting me on a journey about photography. And I, you know, I didn't know I was an art collector then, I did, but I, I had this sense even then that I wanted to have a longer relationship with the work than just seeing it on the walls of a gallery. So that's really the start for me. And now, you know, that work is actually one of the first photographs that I acquired when I became a dentist uh, and started my office in the 1990s. I, I bought this image and had a show of the artist's work, the first show of James Van Der Zee's work in Toronto or in Canada. Uh, that's some images from the show that was in this wedge-shaped space. Uh, that was designed by uh, Del Terralong, a Jamaican-Canadian designer. Very beautiful loft. This was uh, a home and an art gallery in an old knitting factory in downtown Toronto. So in that space, we had a variety of really uh, fun uh, openings. We had a lot of Sunday afternoon salons, and we jumped on the back of the Contact Photography Festival, which is an annual um, celebration of uh, global photography in Toronto. And so these are just some of the images from some of the shows we had in those first few years. And then um, I started to organize exhibitions out of my own collection as it grew. So in uh, 1997, this all started, but in 2008, uh, a decade later is really the first time that I was asked to do a show with works from this wedge collection. So I was, uh, I guess this is a good time to talk about it. I was wedging these artists into the mainstream by having this art project in my home. And that has evolved into a nonprofit called Wedge Curatorial Projects. And we get, you know, government grants and we get uh, 
uh, corporate grants and so forth to put on shows and we bring emerging black artists, mostly Canadian artists, um, you know, into the world that way. We just did a public project in Toronto um, uh, that's a series of photographs on the front of a church building. So, you know, that's one stream. And at the same time, I was collecting work. I was always um, kind of wanting to have that longer relationship. And that, in a very organic way, evolved into the Wedge Collection, which is my privately owned collection. So these are some shows from my Wedge Collection, not from the curatorial project. Um, so I, I, I started to, you know, do this work in local galleries. This is a show from MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary uh, Canadian Art at the time. Um, and, you know, I had very much been thinking about putting together work that had to do with black hairstyles. Very simple trope. But the idea was to, you know, have a very... Um, kind of common image, uh, image of a model from a fashion magazine torn out of the magazine beside, you know, a beautiful photograph from the mid-century from West Africa, from Sedu Keita, or a watercolor from Chris O'Philly. These are artists who I might not be able to afford now, but I was very lucky to sort of uh, be interested in these artists and acquiring the work when I could. And I think maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, Angela, about the art market and about what it is like collecting black artists. Um, we actually had a public haircutting, I guess, as you can see there. It was part of that part of that show. Um, that was part of the first Nuit Blanche in Toronto, our night of art. Uh, that's my Jamaican barber who was brought in to cut hair in the headroom space. So. These are, again, some early shows. I uh, was asked to do a show with some work from my collection at the Nasher Museum of Art in um, Durham, uh, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, which was great. And uh, I became a juror for the Pan-African Photography Festival called the Bamako Encounters and um, met a lot of artists, did studio visits, spent time with artists, followed up with them, and within the year that followed, I, I took off my juror hat and put on my collector hat and acquired a lot of those works and then showed it in a small show at Gallery 44 in Toronto. And then we come to the show that really changed things for me and I think put my collection on the map in a bigger way. Um, I had been wanting to showcase and show everyone works by black Canadian artists. And I guess I wasn't sure if people would respond to it or if it was just my personal interest. Remembering at the time, there was really no institutional uh, acceptance really of black artists. It was a rare thing to have a show of a black artist at the AGO or at the National Gallery here. And, you know, so this is in 2010. And, you know, I, I think it was, uh, the ROM in Toronto, the Royal Ontario Museum, that asked me to do a small show of the collection. Where do you want to do it at the ROM? And I, they showed me the new crystal and so forth. And for me, it was about using the Canadiana galleries, the space where when I was a kid and we took a bus from Windsor to Toronto, we went to the ROM and you went into that space where it's these tropes of Canada with the Inuit, you know, um, costumes and everything sort of put, you know, with these grand paintings of our, you know, white forefathers, our European forefathers. And so I did this, this kind of insertion of works into that space. And it was very successful. It's a small show. And then it toured and it went to um, Pier 21, the uh, Museum of uh, Immigration uh, in Halifax. And then another iteration happily came to my hometown of Windsor. And this was the, the last, uh, the third iteration of that position, this desired show which uh, was at Art Gallery of Windsor, 2017. And some of those works, uh, including Sign by Dawit, uh, Dawit Petros, are in the As We Rise book and now in its own exhibition. There's the book itself. And the subtitle to As We Rise, Photography from the Black Atlantic, um, came from conversations that I had early on with the book publisher, Aperture, where they kind of asked about, you know, where's the work from? And I realized that almost 100% of the work in my collection, the photography part of my collection anyway, is uh, artists and artistic practices that are peripheral to the Atlantic. The UK, West Africa, South Africa, Brazil, the Caribbean, United States, Canada. And that really 
obviously reflects my own story and my family's story right back to the legacy of slavery. So I thought it was an important subtitle, this As We Rise photography from the Black Atlantic. Uh, the, the logo there, As We Rise, that's um, you know, kind of beautifully written, it looks almost hand-painted. It's based on a, a font um, that was created by Trey Seals, who's a young black typographer from, from Washington, D.C., and he created this font called Martin, based on Martin Luther King, and it's, it's based on the sanitation workers in Selma, uh, or sorry, in, um, in uh, uh, Memphis, sorry, in Memphis, and that is this idea of those signs that were hand-painted that said, I am a man, and that's this font that was used for the book, which I really love it, because it brings it back to a kind of a civil rights um, um, perspective as well, which is important, in, in, as you'll see with the images. The book's arranged in three tropes of my collection, community, identity, and power. And, uh, you know, I, I thought when Aperture asked me about a book, oh, we'll do hairstyles or, you know, we'll do music and the things that I think about with I collect. And then it was very clear in our discussions that there was a broader idea at play. And I think that it makes for a very, uh, I think, more appropriate container for these images to think about it. So community, um, and th these are some images from the book itself. Uh, community, is, here's images by the same artist, Dawit Petros, who's Eritrean Canadian. And you know, he came over uh, with his family as um, refugees, basically, and moved to Saskatoon. And you know, one of his early projects when he was in art school at Concordia in Montreal was to kind of document his, uh, his community, a small Eritrean community in Saskatoon. And you know, here's that classic backyard pose that we all have. You know, it's a suburban backyard in Canada, the white picket fence, you know, this idea of family, but we have to think about sameness and difference about, you know, what this family might have been through uh, versus your family, you know? And, and I like this idea of inclusiveness his, his idea of you know, the many different ways of being black Canadian, mixed race families, families from newly arrived from Africa, families that uh, part of the project, you know, showing families that had been here for generations. So you know, I, you know, this is very emblemic of uh, the work that I love and I wanna have this longer relationship with. So it was, it's really great that the book starts with some of these images from a black Canadian artist, Dawit Petros. Within that section, there's also work from um, uh, Mali from West Africa. Um, this is work from the 1950s from Seydou Keita, who's an incredible um, portrait photographer. And we see that this is in this moment of uh, modernism, if you want to call it. This is uh, just at the moment when many African countries are throwing off that cloak of the colonizer and becoming their own um, independent states that are, you know, black owned, black run. And so, you know, Mali is just going to independence in uh, 1960, around from the, the late 50s is the time, 1957, I think. And so, you know, you have these images with women in traditional dress, but, you know, they're riding a Vespa motor scooter that, you know, was maybe from a cousin that's in Paris. And, you know, the, the gentlemen are wearing uh, shirts and pants and those hats that remind you of a Jean-Luc Godard movie or maybe a James Dean movie or something. So it's really this interesting kind of mix of uh, Western and, uh, and African that's happening. And I really love this kind of hybridity. Again, sameness difference, a big trope in my, in my Wedge collection. Uh, in the identity section, um, you know, we see work from an artist like um, Mohamed Kamara, uh, who is West African, but, you know, as a young artist was doing these residencies in Europe, and here he is in the Swiss Alps, and it's all about positioning the black body in these unexpected spaces. Or um, Texas Isaiah, you know, and that's a very uh, contemporary image just from uh, a few years ago. And this is an artist who is really all about showing um, gender fluidity and, and really putting his char, well, it's, I, I would say his because he still goes with he or they, but putting, putting, putting his community, uh, trans community in, 
in front of the camera and this idea of the gaze and gazing back and keeping something for oneself. I think Texas Isaiah, you know, who does a lot of fashion photography now and covers for Vogue magazine and so forth, is part of a new wave of young black photographers who are really just showing themselves in the work. That's a self-portrait, but also about community and about, you know, their personal identity. And I think it's important to show the world of images uh, rather than being focused on one way of being black. I think this is about the multiplicity and so forth. Some images from uh, South Africa from Lolo Vileko and um, Ariel Bob Willis is an American photographer. Uh, and the work on the right from, from Ariel is a fashion shoot that's actually from you know a magazine. I, I'm not sure, I think it was for Elle magazine, but this idea that so many young black photographers have no, no problem with this idea of being a commercial photographer and being a fine art photographer and straddling those worlds in their work. She's actually someone who suffers from depression and one of her interesting tropes in her own practice is to try to convey these sense, the different senses of you know, her own mental state in the poses of her subjects. Very interesting artist. And the power section of the book um, very much is uh, about not only black power, but this idea of agency, this idea of, of ownership. You know, th th there was a time when uh, images of black folks were really, you know, in the, in the time of the invention of the camera, it was about making these images for European consumption. And you saw lots of images of black people on, in the continent of Africa or from the Caribbean that were in either uh, slavery or in, in, in um, you know, indentured labor kind of conditions. And, you know, standing in front of the camera, you know, holding, uh, you know, in, in a field of sugar cane and you would see the, the master there, you know, holding their, their bull whip or their gun. And, you know, these kind of images were what early photography of black people was about. And, and I just wanted to kind of push back on that and show, you know, images that really are where the, the, the photographer and the subject themselves have agency over who they are and who they want to be. And, um, you know, here's a very provocative image from Micheline Thomas, who's a very well-known contemporary artist, and that's a self-portrait. She's, she's taking on a character. She's working with this classic kind of uh, obelisk, you know, like sort of, uh, you know, leaning back at leisure. She's kind of put her studio together to look like a basement with the paneling and she's putting on an Afro wig. And it's all about, you know, in her case, self-love and self-care. And, you know, and I think these are really important images to show. Um, an image on the right here from uh, Renee Cox. It's a very iconic image to Jamaicans and Jamaican Canadians. It's uh, the artist herself taking on the, the persona of Nanny, the Queen of the Maroons, and the Maroons were, um, it, well, well, Nanny uh, was was the sort of leader of enslaved people in Jamaica who would go in at night and do these strategic sort of raids on plantations and pull enslaved people out and then go up into the hills and cockpit country in Jamaica and you know an incredible uh, hero that you know we just didn't hear about. I didn't learn about her when I was, you know, in history class in Windsor. And so you have to kind of, you know, do a little research and bring out your own history. So I like to collect work that talks about black history in a kind of a very specific way. I like this idea of the artist taking on this persona, you know, uh, it's, it's a power move for me. And the, the work on the left is um, from Camille Turner and Kamal Purbai. And um, this, they're Canadian artists who are thinking about you know our own black canadian history so it's too hard to read because it's so small but the the text that's at the top of that photograph is really describing the clothes that the the subject the gentleman is wearing you know a, a waistcoat and you know red coat and he's carrying a violin case and the, all of these things are really lifted exactly word for word from a description for a slave wanted ad that was in the Montreal Gazette, you know? So it's, it's kind of fascinating. And she's got the artist, uh, has got the subject 
um, dressed and, and reclaiming, you know, these clothes. It almost looks like an ad for Old Navy or The Gap or something. You know, it's this idea of taking this want ad, you know, for a runaway slave and making it into something that they want to see, you know. And I, I think this is really important, this idea of the black imaginary. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to just roll through some images that are in the book As We Rise and part of a show now that is going to be touring around uh, the world, we hope. It's starting uh, at my alma mater at University of Toronto, where I studied dental school, and it just opened earlier this month. Uh, the As We Rise exhibition will then go to Vancouver, to the Polygon. It started at the Art Museum at University of Toronto, and then Polygon Gallery in Vancouver, and then it will go to the Peabody Essex Museum, which is a kind of an encyclopedic museum, much like the ROM that's in uh, Salem uh, near Boston, Massachusetts. So we hope it will keep touring. Hope you folks will get a chance to see it. And I will take a few minutes now to just roll through some of the images in the book uh, and then give you a little quick, quick uh, insight. Uh, this image may be familiar to many of you because it's becoming an iconic image. Um, it's the artist Malik Sidibe, who was a friend of mine, he died recently, but uh, I visited him three times in Bamako, Mali, going as a collector, going as a juror for the, that Pan-African um, festival, and also just going to see him and, and find out about the history of uh, photography in his country. And this particular image is, uh, you know, a couple dancing uh, in their, you know, in their yard, it's a party, it's Christmas Eve, it's uh, Nuit de Noël, um, and this particular photographer, you know, made his living going out to parties and social events, remembering again, this is 1963, Mali has just become independent, there's a lot of celebration, you can imagine again, just like the clothing, the music is this expression of modernism, there would be like, maybe uh, they're doing the, tw the twist, you know, which would be a popular dance or something, or they're listening to the Beatles. Uh, some of his images show people holding records by Jimi Hendrix. It's very fascinating, you know? And so these are kind of, in a lot of ways, unknown histories. I love this image. It, you know, the artist told me um, that it's actually a brother and sister, a brother showing his younger sister how to dance, maybe the twist, you know? So I, I just think it's a loving image. This one is usually up in our home, uh, in, you know, and my wife and I get to enjoy it in our room, but it's a thrill to have it, you know, out in a show that's touring and, and people get to share in, in the beauty of it. Um, another great artist uh, from, uh, from Cameroon, uh, and I think the artist Samuel Faso was uh, born in the Central African Republic, but you know he was coming of age in a time in the 70s where there was a lot of political, political strife and there was a a uh, Biafran war happening in neighboring Nigeria. And he had a photo practice, a very entrepreneurial guy. He had a photo practice set up already as a teenager. You know, he might have been 17 or 18 years old in this picture. And he was taking passport photos and the like. And at night, when he had extra film, he would just put on these costumes and pose as, you know, imagine characters. This is in the disco era, so it's 1978. And he's posing as an American disco dancer. It's just amazing to me, you know? I think this is like, you know, for me, uh, what it's all about, showing these many different ways of being black and, and, and through, through time and, and through uh, space, you know? Uh, Van Lee Burke um, is a black British photographer who, um, is, his family's from Jamaica, and they moved to Birmingham. Uh, and that was all part of the, what we call the Windrush generation. It was a, a ship called the Windrush that brought so many Caribbean immigrants to England to kind of clean up after the war. And the idea was, you know, you're going to make a few bucks in the motherland and then come back home to Jamaica. And, you know, again, this is when Jamaica's a colony. It got its independence in 1962. So, you know, the reality was facing extreme racism and, you know, often breaking into violence at the time and, and political parties like the National Front that were, you know, openly racist and violent in their actions. And so this 10-year-old kid, um, you know, in, uh, 
you know, in, in his name is Winford, in the Hansworth Park, a, a big public park, is kind of risking his life putting this Union Jack, this British flag on his bicycle and saying, this is who I am. And I love this image because I remember being a kid like that in Windsor and I had like my little Canadian flag. You know? I was never as cool as this kid, but I do remember this idea of, you know, saying this is who I am, you know, when people would ask you like, where are you from? It's like, well, I'm Canadian, you know, no, where are you really from? I'm Canadian, you know, yeah. Um, you know, another great image from a, a British photographer, and I guess you can see we're kind of going a bit geographical here, which is not the way the book is set up, but I thought it would be helpful to, to kind of think about those regions of the Black Atlantic. So we're in the UK here. Um, Liz Johnson Arthur is a pretty great photographer who is doing, again, a lot of images around fashion and so forth, but she has a personal project called the Black Balloon Archive. And she just takes pictures wherever she goes on photo shoots, and often it's young people. And I, I love this growing archive of just the many different ways of how we live as black folks, the beauty of ordinary black life, you know? I, I love this enigmatic pose. I don't know if, it's like Mona Lisa, I don't know if this young woman is, you know, giving us a kind of a quizzical look? Is she being protective because someone's taking her picture? Is it just a moment where she was talking to someone and she's turned her head? I remember asking the artists when I purchased this work a few years ago, so, you know, what was happening? Is this a funeral? Is it an outdoor concert? And she, <laughs> we, we hadn't met at that point. We were on email and she emailed me back and said, you know, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> yeah. And I really loved that, too, because I thought that was really great to keep that sense of mystery about the image. Uh, and, you know, there are just many different uh, kind of artistic um, kind of strategies about how to make an image powerful. And for her, it's like, just accept it as it is and make your own story out of it. And I love that. Um, here's some work from South America. It's a photographer, Afonso Pimenta, who is not well known, uh, probably his first collector and um, you know, saw a very small project about his work and was thrilled to find out that I could acquire work from this artist that was doing work, uh, you know, taking family photos, doing lots of portrait stuff in the 1990s. And it's just, again, black life, you know, just ordinary life. It's like a mother and the two young kids around their house and you see the trophies, you see the, you know, they're in front of the bar, there's a boy in his bedroom and it's just like, it could be anywhere in the world, you know, all these fantasy images. He's, you know, got his, his kind of, um, his nunchucks there and he's, he's probably watching Bruce Lee movies and, you know, fantasizing about, you know, uh, well, it's kind, of, it's kind of an interesting kind of image because it's got this hyper-masculinity to it, but there's so much tenderness and vulnerability in his bedroom. It's a very interesting, intimate image. And you know, these were not intended as art pieces. These were you know, kind of photographs of friends in a community in Belo Horizonte in, in Brazil. It was not supposed to be work that you know, we would celebrate one day, but it becomes this important archive of how life was, was like in this predominantly black area in uh, southeastern Brazil. Uh, here's some work from American artists. Uh, Ebony Patterson is Jamaican, Jamaican born, and now um, it lives in America, but I should cor correct that and say this is some work from Caribbean artists. And Ebony's work, again, thinks about masculinity and in some ways toxic masculinity in Jamaica, but also the incredible uh, kind of subculture of dance, dance hall and, and reggae. And, you know, she's using her um, grandmother's doilies that would be, you know, on the dresser and she's painted them gold. And, you know, she's showing, uh, again, these tropes of fashion. It's like a polo, Ralph Lauren polo shirt, but she's got these, you know, cut out photographs of fish. And it's, it's all these mixings of color and pattern and, you know, you're supposed to think, of course, about this face that's painted white, which at the time was one of the uh, kind of, you know, kind of ideas that was happening in the dance hall culture. And she wants you to think about that. Like, what's behind this painting the face white? Is it this, is it like, you know, a Michael Jackson thing? Is it actually something that's, you know, uh, supposed to be about 
uh, the ghost culture and the folklore about the duppy. Like it, it's an interesting kind of um, manifestation that was happening at that time in dance hall culture. And she takes it a step further with putting it in the context of this radical environment of color and a riot of pattern. Here's some work from a Jamaican artist, uh, Ruddy Roy, who um, is, a, is an artist and an activist, but you know, he took this beautiful series and we have these up in our home because I want my kids to grow up in this environment where they see the beauty of, you know, of just ordinary black folks, you know, but, but young people in Jamaica on a beach that is their own beach, not the beach that the tourists go to where they say, you know, no trespassing. It's a beach where you can just wear your brassiere, you know, bring your, your music and have a little fish fry or, you know, have some jerk chicken. And I love this idea of just pictures of ordinary people, not so much celebrity photography. Um, how are we doing on time? Where are we at? Maybe five, 10 more minutes? Okay, I'll just blaze through some of this stuff. Uh, an image from Detroit, again, across from where I grew up in Windsor. Uh, a couple after church on a Sunday. Reminds me of my late parents, you know, this idea of uh, how, you know, you kind of grow together and, you know, it's, a, it's about um, showing the foundation which for so many of us as black people is family and family life. And, you know, it's, it's a very famous photographer, Gordon Parks. So uh, when my mom died around 2014, I thought it was important to kind of bring this image into the collection because it was, you, you, you kind of want these pieces that mean something to you at a very personal level. Kwame Brathwaite, who, you know, put together black fashion shows in America. He and his brother invented the term black is beautiful and, uh, you know, pushed against this idea that you could not have black women in like a, you know, Miss USA concert they just, or a contest. They just started their own fashion agency and fashion shows that toured around America. Um, that's the artist's wife, uh, Sokolo. Jamel Shabazz, well known for his images of kind of the birth of hip hop. He was just one of those kids. He was 19 years old, taking pictures in the 80s of his friends, and now it becomes this important record, this document of, of a particular scene in New York. Paul Anthony Smith, um, who you know is a Caribbean artist who lives in New York and does a lot of images of Caribbean festivals like Carabana in Toronto or, you know, Caribbean Day in New York where this image was taken or an image in Notting Hill in London. Uh, this was up in the Denl office where I work and it was so great for my staff during the pandemic because it was like, wow, there was a moment when people were together like this <laughs> on the street, hugging and dancing, you know, really got us through. It's a big photograph, almost the size of what you see here, probably five by four feet. Another uh, image from the pandemic. I have so few in my collection, but I bought this image in 2020 and it was taken in 2020. Um, Kennedy Carter, who's become a, a, um, a kind of well-known um, photographer for fashion. And she is having her hair cut by her father around the house. And that was so much like it was that year. Tyler Mitchell, uh, another um, artist who's doing very well. He took uh, that picture of Beyonce and became the first, uh, that's not this image, but became the first black photographer to have a, a photograph on the cover of Vogue magazine. This is another one of his images, um, and which became the cover of another book, um, uh, the, the New Black Vanguard. Chun Li, these are some Canadian artists that I will end with, um, who's Korean, African-American, and he had this great essay on fathers and sons, New York City. Um, this is work from uh, Yannick Anton, who's you know, a Toronto photographer. And again, this shows you that I was trying to mix up that book with well-known photographers like Gordon Parks or James Van Der Zee with an unknown photographer from Toronto, like Yannick, who did these party pics, you know, going to Yes, Yes, Y'all, a kind of a monthly party that's very, very like, kind of like, open uh, for every community. You can just be yourself. And uh, you know, I love these images. In our show, I have about 14 of these photographs all kind of in, our, in, a, in a circle. 
uh, Jorian Charlton, who just had a show at the AGO in Toronto, Jamaican Canadian photographer. That there's such a kind of a to me, and to anyone in the crowd, like my cousin Patsy, who's here with her daughter Marie. Uh, it just looks like a 1970s photograph of one of my cousins or aunties, you know, in Jamaica. But it's right now. She's she's doing this very nostalgic thing. We can all look at this and sort of see the seventies kind of vibe. Um, Bedemi Oliedi, who is a very young photographer, Nigerian Canadian, I bought this work from his graduation show at the Ontario College of Art and Design. He came out of school for, fully formed. He's using tin types, a very old, old technique in photography, to showcase black activists and people that are part of Black Lives Matter Toronto. So it was really Black Lives Matter Canada. So it was really an important uh, kind of development that this young person is using an old technique to show something very pertinent, very now. Sandra Brewster is one of our artists in Canada who's doing so well and is international now. And she's thinking about her family coming from Guyana and using this actual motion of blurring. It's called the Blur series to think about um, you know, you can't fix yourself on the subject. It's about concealing and revealing. And here are some, I'm just going to end with some shots of the show As We Rise, As We Rise in Toronto, which just opened. So you can see some of these photographs that I've shown you images of actually framed from my collection that are on the wall at the Art Museum at University of Toronto. So I'm going to encourage all of you to get down there by November 19th to see the show. You can see there's some interesting ways that I've collected these works. These are works from Ayanna Jackson that are on poly silk and you know the air currents of the room make them almost kind of dance, really beautiful. And uh, I'll end with this quote from Liz Akiriko who's an independent curator in Toronto and a good friend and who did a lot of the writing in As We Rise. The pictures here forefront the experience of black life in all its myriad forms, a marker of the histories and spaces, real and ephemeral, that transcend geographic boundaries. The collection extends out to a global diaspora and proclaims, we are home. And so I'll end with that and I'm gonna encourage everyone to go and get a book. I'll do some signing for you. I think the books will be at the bookstore. Before we do that, I'd like to bring Angela Cassie back up here, and maybe we can have a quick chat. Thank you, everyone. Wow, thank you so much. I could just, That's I could, good. I could hear you and listen to you talk uh, all evening, and uh, I've just learned so much, and and. Um, I've, I've had the book and I've been paging through it and um, you've just made it so much more accessible and I've opened it up thank so you. much. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation um, and we haven't rehearsed this at all. So we'll, we'll see where we go. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, a dentist and an art collector. Um, what, what inspired you? I, you talked about As We Rise, but, but how did art become the vehicle for you? Hmm. I, I would say I was lucky, lucky to have grown up in a family where, you know, neither parents were artists. My mom was a dietitian. My father was an educator. Uh, but they had a great appreciation of art. And, you know, we actually had some paintings, original paintings, by Jamaican artists in the house, not well known, not super valuable, but it was an environment where we got to kind of see and sense the power of art. There was a lot of music in the house. So I think it was something that was in me, but you know, either you have that collecting bug or you don't, you know? <laughs> like for many of you, it's like, it's great to go to an art gallery and you're very enriched by the experience. I'm sure you're all art lovers. For some of us, some of us it's like, I gotta have that image. I gotta <laughs> put it with this one to keep telling stories. And um, I guess I was uh, lucky enough at the time as a young dentist to have the income to actually buy some of these works. But, you know, the 
as you know, the art market has changed. And so, I, again, I wouldn't be able to buy a lot of the work that's in the collection now. But I got started really in a, in a way of, of just uh, as a labor of love and as my own, you know, for my own identity. Again, I wasn't growing up in a community where there were a lot of black folks. I was like the only black kid in the class, you know? So that was kind of how it was for me in Windsor. So I saw these images and it was a kind of a personal education and a bit of a research project to learn about my own culture. I, I luckily had the, the great fortune that my father was a teacher so we could spend summers in Jamaica. So I had this place where it was like, yeah, I saw black folks that were dentists and blah, 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 blah. And you know, a cousin was a dentist and, and you know, it, it was an influential thing to have role models. But, you know, there was this dance that happened. And as you know, there was a lot of code shifting that would happen. And, you know, code shifting to save my life in Windsor. It was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and I mean, I think, you know, part, part of this conversation, um, you know, that uh, as we rise, I just want to kind of dig into that because, you know, you yeah. talked about the love of collecting and um, that kind of element of identity project. But there's one thing to say, I have to have that and, and build that collection. But like, how do you even know that you've become a collector? How do you start navigating in those spaces? How, you know, you've, yeah. you talked about showing it in your home. Uh, you know, th these places and spaces haven't kind of welcomed black voices in terms of art. But then yeah. as a collector, you're, you're kind of almost a bit of a bridge between the artists and the institution. So how did you navigate that kind of now I'm a collector kind of yeah, identity Yeah, it's a great piece. question, Angela, yeah, because, you know, I think people just think, oh, yeah, well, he's a collector, you've been doing that, you know, it, it's a very organic mm -hmm. process, it, it's, I didn't know what a collector was when I was a kid, who does, you know, I mean, not in my world. Mm -hmm. um, the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem, uh, Thelma Golden, who's a well-known person in the art world, um, became a friend more than 20 years ago, and I think she introduced me at an opening at her public gallery in New York, the Studio Museum in Harlem, introduced me as this, you know, emerging collector from Canada. And it was the first time that someone had called me a collector. <laughs> and I was like, I thought, wow, you know, tell me, you think I'm a collector? She goes, you're a collector. You, you know, look, you've already got this and this and you're, you know, you're, you're buying this work, you're proud of it. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I hadn't actually thought of myself as a collector, but, this idea of um, ownership of, uh, in some ways, for me is more like I'm taking care of these pictures. I don't really own them, although yes, legally, it's my privately owned collection, but I feel like the custodian. These works are, I'm, I'm lending them all the time. You know, I just lent a painting to a show that's at Tate Britain. I'm gonna go to London next month to see this opening, Lynette Yadam Boyachi. Um, I want people to see the work. Uh, I don't know if my eight-year-old and five-year-old son will be collectors. They're going to inherit some stuff. <laughs> you know, the idea might be to, you know, give away some of these works to institutions that will take care of the works. The idea might be to keep them, some of them together, mm -hmm. maybe under their own banner in a, in a place that we can't imagine yet. Maybe it's not even a physical space. It's about, you know, the many different ways that you disseminate these images, books, mm -hmm. publishing, mm -hmm. exhibitions. So I don't get too caught up in about where it's going. Mm -hmm. And I know you didn't ask me that, but I'm taking your question and I'm rolling with it. <laughs> okay. uh, but I, I certainly can tell you that, you know, it came from a place of um, spontaneity, labor of love, just kind of very organic, not knowing, but knowing that it made me feel great to see the images in my home. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for opening up a little yeah. bit of that for us. Um, now we've kind of, we've said the word art market a little bit. So we talked about kind of becoming, kind of coming into your identity as a collector, but um, you know, we have in the crowd perhaps some emerging artists as well who are starting to, you know, what it is, what does it mean to have someone collect your work, but also what does it mean to navigate this art market? And I know for myself, that's something that I'm kind of still continuing to learn and unpack coming into the more art gallery place and space. And I didn't recognize the role that the art market played. So can you unpack that for us a little yeah. bit? <laughs> sure. Um, so when we use this term, the art market, it's just like the stock market or something. It's, it's, it's the commercial part of this whole endeavor. And it's to be respected, you have to learn about it. You're, you have a responsibility as a collector to understand 
the forces of the market around you and understand why this work is this value and this one is that value. But I have to say for me, again, it, I wasn't thinking about any of those things when I started. I was like, I love this image. How much does it cost? Oh, I can't afford that. Oh, this one I can't afford. So <laughs> it, went like, it wasn't like I was buying this thing because I'm going to flip it in two years and yeah. make you know $500,000. No, it really um, is something that uh, changed in the time that I had been doing it. My wheelhouse and my world of black artists, there wasn't a lot of demand. And like any market, it's supply and demand. It's economic forces. And so I saw, I watched over the 25 years I've been doing this since 1997, where the demand has increased and really exponentially was not there at the beginning. Um, I couldn't give away this work to institutions. I was like keeping it for myself. Now there's such a demand. Um, you know, every institution, including your own here, um, wants to foreground the work of black artists. And many institutions have been doing that for many years. Others, not so much. But it is essential that you show these works and do programming around these black artists now. I watched the change over time with a degree of amusement because you know I've been in the trench doing this work for a long time. I've always known the inherent value and the beauty of these works. It just took the market a long time to catch up to that. I try not to get too caught up in the thing. You have to understand it. But if there was uh, a situation now where they, the works never went up in value as they have, uh, I'd still be happy. I bought the work you know, because I loved the work. And I loved the stories. I had relationships that I developed with all of these artists, all the living artists I know in my collection, and I've visited them mm -hmm. in Bamako, in Philadelphia, in London, England. And so they've come to my home in Toronto. It's a kind of a lifestyle, a part of mm -hmm. my life. And so it's been very enriching. I try not to worry too much about if tomorrow the bottom falls out. And it can, as you know. Mm -hmm. People move on to the next thing. Right now, in the art market, black artists are, you know, wow, the value is going up. Maybe in 10 years from now, it's moved on to Eastern European artists or something else. And I can't get too caught up in that. I'm, but my role, though, as a collector, I must end and say, is to ensure that you know these artists won't be forgotten, mm -hmm. to make sure that they are at the table, that all these important institutions, like your own here at the National Gallery, acquire these works for their permanent collections. And, and the way I think that I'd like to, to kind of do that or in, envision that is more black people actually collecting art. So I have a personal mission where I'm trying to bring you know, young people into this idea. Yeah, you can be an artist, you can be a curator, you can be a writer, you can be a critic, you can be a gallery owner, you can be a collector. Like you don't, you know, everyone just thinks I can just be a black artist. No, you can also, you know, be, have different roles in the art ecosystem. I think it's so important. We need more black collectors. Yeah. You, can, you know, then the narrative is more in your kind of control. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. yeah, yeah, the control of the narrative. And I mean, I think that's yeah. what's interesting about your decision to publish this book, right? right? Because very often we think about art in a an exhibition kind of standpoint, and it starts and ends. But but I think was was that part of your motivation with with writing the book to start creating that legacy and making it longer term and sustainable? Yeah, I thought you're exactly right. It was to make a document and, you know, no matter what happens with the collection, whatever, you want to sort of know that these images were together in one place and they gain, you know, they really gain by, I see this myself because I, was, I had never put the collection all together like this and I see where there's a power in uh, more is more, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to um, just, I'm going to ask you a few more questions and then we're going to go to the crowd. So I know there's probably questions, uh, so start thinking of those. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about kind of your decision to um, really um, choose images that present images of black joy. Um, and I mean, we saw a few examples of that. Um, and, and I've read that you've called that a bit of a radical act. And I know you touched on it um, a little bit earlier, but could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, black joy. Yeah, so I would define my collection like just that way, you know? I, and I think that's, it's very true, this, um, you know, again, I'm sure both of us grew up with this, 
you know, proliferation of images in the media that were always about black suffering or oppression. And even in this moment, you know, in this post Black Lives Matter moment, you know, uh, it's like so much about, you know, violent acts and poverty. And I just really wanted to ensure that at that same time, not forgetting about the importance of those images, also show everyone, you know, that there is joy, there is beauty, there is, you know, harmony, sisterly, brotherly love, self-love, like all these things are also important. In fact, maybe are the essential ingredients that kept my community going through all of that oppression. So, you know, it, it just, it, it seems so simple, but it is radical to show a collection, you know, of images where, it's all very aspirational. It's up, and I maybe some people read that as facile or oh, you're not dealing with. And I'm like, yeah, read the book, see the images. There's a lot of images of protests. There's a lot of it's 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 a lot about though the uplift. This idea that we're pulling each other up, we're holding each other, we're kind of making space for ourselves, and we're doing it. Um, globally. I didn't want it to be just about, you know, this place that I'm from. And I kind of really feel like um, we, we, we need more of this kind of uh, reading of images too. Like, uh, you know, now we, we know there are courses at university that talk about black history and I, I'm all for moving to a place where we include more academic uh, courses around black joy and the idea of leisure time and the idea of, you know, in the midst of all this pain and suffering and through days of enslavement and so forth, always, always there was this persistent threat of people in our community taking care of each other. This, mm -hmm. this black joy thing, finding moments, making time for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what it's about. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I th thank you for unpacking that because I think um, very often, um, you know, in in that uh, desire to have people have a shared understanding of that history, there's that. I think you talked about it an erasure as a flattening, and it's not that one isn't true yeah. in the other. Um, and I remember, um, you know, having been schooled kind of in Canada, and the only snippets of kind of Black history were around enslavement. You know that drawing that sense of identity, that sense of pride, um, and it was someone uh, who was an elder in the community who, at one point, you know, kind of used the phrase, you know, remembering that you you came from ancestors who were kings and queens, mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of maybe taps a little bit into that sense of a broader identity as well. And you talked a lot about having that art there for your sons to be able to kind of give them that sense of identity and pride. Yeah, yeah, you know, thank you That's for that. True. You're welcome. So um, before we go to the crowd, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about you as a collector and, and you talked about wedging against the mainstream organizations. <laughs> so yeah. um, is it still a wedge? Is it becoming a hammer? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it, you, you talked about the trend in the market. Um, so, so, I mean, I think we can point to a few moments in, in our shared kind of global history as to why perhaps that shift has happened, um, particularly with the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, post George Floyd. Um, do you see institutions genuinely engaging differently? Um, and you know, kind of what kind of um, new narratives should cultural institutions be thinking of? Yeah, that's a great question, Angela. Um, well, you know, I'm a trustee at the Art Gallery of Ontario, the AGO in Toronto, and I can use, you know, my experience there as an example. Um, I've been a trustee for six years now, and before that I was on the photography curatorial committee, so I know that place over a decade very well. And, you know, I had been pushing as a, a committee member and then later as a trustee for, you know, more representation of black artists in the collection and images of black people in the collection. And it was very thrilling to me to be part of this, you know, uh, a, a kind of a phenomenon. Something that happened while I was there was um, a curator that I'm sure you know, Julie Crooks in Toronto, who's a curator of um, uh, black art and artists and has a background in um, West African studio photography. She 
uh, just to make a long story short, she, she came upon and found a collection of images, someone like myself, you know, who's a collector, a gentleman named Patrick Montgomery in New York, and he owned a collection of thousands of images of vintage black and white images of the Caribbean, a lot of images through the colonial era. So this Montgomery collection he was selling, and uh, I worked with Julie at the AGO to get people in our own black community to acquire this work. You know, we had people coming in um, that were donating, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And we, it was, the idea was for us, by us. We're gonna do this and have it in the AGO. And then, you know, our kids get to see these images on the wall of, you know, people from Trinidad or from, you know, Martinique, from Jamaica, from Guyana, from, you know, and, it, and it's been a very remarkable thing to see the reaction for, for me. I thought it was, you know, for the community, but it's become something for everyone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people look at these images, uh, just the way I was talking about the, how we look at these family images, think, oh, that's like my auntie in the 1970s. Well, people see images and it doesn't matter if you're from, Brazil, or you're from Czechoslovakia, or you're from Israel, you know, you look at these images from the Montgomery collection and you're like, yeah, I see my own family because we're a country of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so putting this work on display in, in a show called Fragments of Epic Memory, where it was paired with contemporary Caribbean images, was a very powerful thing. And the AGO owns this work. And out of that, I think there was a lot of public interest. And finally, the AGO has decided to have a contemporary African art department, the new uh, Department of Global Arts of Global Africa and the diaspora, which Julie is leading. So you see how these gestures kind of grow and then people engage in it. It becomes something that's meaningful and then it leads to something permanent. You know, you have this new department that's gonna focus on this kind of work. So I, I saw it actually happening. Change can happen, but it does take some you know, purposeful action and thought, but it but it can happen, you know. And voices like yours at the table. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> and voices like yours oh, at the table. On. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a labor of love for yeah. me, it's easy, yeah. 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 Thank you, yeah. so I think we're gonna try to take a few questions from the audience. Oh, yeah, I yeah. see hands flying <laughs> <up. laughs> I'm gonna say family hold back. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, do you, how do you want to do it? Oh, give the microphone. Yeah, yeah. so my, um, if you want to voice your question, and then David will repeat, repeat it in the it. microphone. Oh, okay. Uh, any uh, photos or a book on southwestern Ontario? All right. The question is, are there any, do you have any photos or a book on southwestern Ontario? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, in my personal collection, not in Aspie Rise, but I have a set of images of... Um, early settlers in the black community in southwestern Ontario, Windsor, Amherstburg, um, Blenheim, Chatham, Dresden, um, images that when I see them, I try to bring them into my collection. Uh, as yet, I haven't published that work, but I've lent some of those images to touring shows, and Julie Crooks at the AGO had a show called True Black North that showcased those images, and I'm pushing hard still to have a catalog you know of that work because it would be great to have a document um, I grew up in Windsor where there was this very strong proud historic black community um, much of those you many of those families were descendants of enslaved people that ran away from the states and you know Windsor Detroit of course that very close sort of border and coming over and the cover of night uh, one, my first uh, role in the art ecosystem was being a, a docent, being someone who worked at a gallery in Amherstburg, the North American Black Historical Museum, which has now become the Freedom Museum. So I'm saying all this to say that I have a deep interest in those stories about southwestern Ontario, and I'm hoping that, you know, that we'll be able to maybe raise funds with my nonprofit wedge curatorial projects to, to put together a project around that. I appreciate your, your question and your interest. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. yeah all right, okay. very good. You're an Amherstburg guy. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. Essex County. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't a think I've ever heard too, anyone yeah. say it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But it, I think yes. it's, it's great because you were also talking about the importance of photography as, ar as archive, yes. right? So I think yeah, kind of what I'm it. hearing you is that there's that bridge uh, that you're creating as well. Yeah, yeah, I think you have to kind of put the images together 
so that they can tell stories amongst themselves. It's, it's, a single image is, is important. A group of images says, oh, you know, lots of stuff happened here. It's not a one-off. There's a history here. There's a community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So I see a hand here. And sorry, the, the light is a little bit difficult. So I see a hand here, one in the middle, and then one to the side. Uh, so do we want to start here? That's we're a great question. Let David yeah. the question. Is, is there a, a piece, a particular piece, that's had an important impact on you? Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many things for that question, Marie. Um, <clears throat> there are so many images that in the collection that I love and that mean so much to me. I think the image that you know you saw up here with, um, <clears throat> sorry, Dawit Petros, this you know image of the Hedenbe's family, the Eritrean family, in front of their you know, in their backyard. I don't know, there's something about that that posed family photo around the house that just gets to me, I love it. Like we have that image in our home too. It's not our family, but I love this idea of, you know, showing the many different kinds and ways of having family and thinking about what that particular family went through and you know how you just would see them at the mall or at a Tim Hortons and sort of go, hey, it's a family. But somehow the intimacy of this backyard photograph, knowing that this family came to Canada coming from a situation that was not, you know, untenable and and how you know you kind of become part of a new community mirrors and echoes much of what our family has gone through, and so it means something to me in a very personal way. That that image is one of the ones for sure. They're all my babies, but <laughs> but that one is like, yeah, that's that's a family. Yeah. yeah. Et je voulais juste aussi mentionner si vous voulez demander vos questions en français, on peut les prendre en français aussi. Alors je vois un ici et puis là après. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Montigny. So you know, it's interesting. Sometimes we, we meet collectors, collectors from different backgrounds, and by following art advisors as they go there by that. Mm -hmm. What we see with this fantastic uh, collection you have a lot of emotion and also encounters and relationship with artists. Can you tell me? Because you seem to know all these artists. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and you went to Bamako, you meet them. So, how does that work? The question is... Um, <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm how does that work? <laughs> I'm yeah. going to get it. Um, Serge was asking that quite often collections grow um, from relationships between collectors and art advisors, but in your case it seems to be a more personal thing that you travel to cities around the world and you meet with the artists, and can you talk about that? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, I guess I was lucky in the sense, it's, you're going to laugh, but being a dentist, you know, I got to go to, you know, a dental convention in Paris. But I would make sure that I would go to the convention that happened during Paris Photo, you know, and so I could go and, uh, you know, so I used my uh, life and career as a dentist a lot of times to, you know, I can remember numerous times going to a New York dental convention at, uh, you know, the Javits Center, but then after I did my lecture that day or, you know, hung out with my dentist and did my thing, I'd spend the whole next day, you know, in Chelsea, New York, walking around galleries or meeting artists up in Harlem. And so I would use my life as a dentist in some ways as a ticket to travel. And that was one thing. And then after a while, it, you know, the trips became more dedicated to art. But it, it started as something that... Uh, like so many of us, we have a career and we have an, an interest, you know, whether it's reading or sports or, and then it becomes, you know, the reason that you really choose a destination. I want to go to that dental convention in Denver, not for the skiing, but to go to the Denver Art Museum where that show of that artist who I'm interested in is showing. And it, it kind of went like that. So it's, it's kind of funny to think about it. But over many years, I have to say, uh, you know, the, the start of it was a blending of my career with my interests. Yeah, yeah. And then can you talk a little bit about the relationship building with the artists? Like, you talked yeah. about an email exchange, but, you know, my name is Kenneth, I'm a doctor from Canada. I'm, yeah. You know, how, how does that work? Yeah, yeah, I know that's the second part of the question. <laughs> yeah. um, well, it, you'd be amazed if you, you know, everyone feels, and I understand this because I used to feel the same way, we all feel so intimidated 
going into an art gallery, especially in New York City, at these, you know, in, it's, at, and sometimes the people there, of course, don't do a lot to make you feel comfortable. It's very exclusive. And my whole thing is inclusivity, you know? So, you know, I, I just, after, you know, embarrassing myself, I think, many times when I was younger, I lost that sense of shame or whatever pride. I just go and I'm like, you know, I, think, I think it helps, of course, to have done a little research, which is very easy these days. With, with you know, It wasn't when I started when there really wasn't social media and so forth. But you, know, you can learn a lot about an artist that you've seen you know, in a gallery situation, you know, say at the National Gallery here. I can see work from Rashid Johnson and I can go and I can Google it up and I can find out. You know what, I happen to know Rashid and I've known him over many years, but I wouldn't be afraid to call the artist direct message the artist, reach out to their gallery. Um, if you do a little research and the person who picks up the phone or who gets that email at the gallery understands that you truly appreciate the artist, they'll connect you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really amazing. It's not as hard as you think. You just have to kind of show that it's not that you're just going to try to get the work and get it at a discount. You're going to meet the artist to get to know the artist better. Once they connect you with the artist, and we're talking about gallery artists, but in many cases here, these were artists that still don't have gallery representation. It was a matter of me getting on the phone or finding out their email from a website, reaching out to them directly. Oh, hey, I'm in Toronto. I'm going to be at blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, so you're from New Orleans and... I'm going to be there for a convention. I'm going to be there for an art fair. Let's meet. And I do that all the time. You know, I, I think a studio visit, the idea of calling up an artist and going to their turf, not coming to your house, to their studio, it's very important. They're comfortable there. And they will show you things beyond maybe what you went to look for. I mean, I love this artist's work and I love your painting, but oh, you like that? That's from this series and here's six or seven others. Oh, you might find something else. So uh, engaging the artists in a one-on-one -on -one is so important. And I think, I mean, I realize I'm privileged to be able to travel like this, but even if you can't, you have the means now through the internet to kind of reach people. And I feel like, you know, the only good thing out of this strange time we've just been through is the fact that it's kind of easier now to set up a little Zoom meeting or to connect people virtually. And I do a lot of that now, and I never considered that before. So there's many ways that you can connect uh, with artists without, um, you know, feeling that there's this impossible wall between you. I think if they see that you're genuine about it, your interest, it's a very easy thing. They're always thrilled. And I, many of you are artists in the audience, I'm sure, too. Artists are always thrilled to have someone kind of know a little bit about their work, especially underknown artists. They're like, wow, you actually heard about me? You know about my work? And, you know, yeah. they're flattered. Yeah. 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 So I think I'm hearing something in terms of aspiring collectors, but also for emerging artists. When you get yes. that message, that relationship building, and there's something about going to the collector, but there's also about welcoming them to your space and showing them how to work, and there's that relationship building on that side. Yeah. Thank you. You learn a lot. Yeah. We're going to have to call it a day. I'm so sorry. Ah, oh, come on. I'm having fun now. We should, you know. <laughs> well, we're yeah, going to still right. have a lot of time to be able to talk. Uh, we're going to do the book signing. Yeah. So hopefully, I know that I missed some of you with the with the questions, but we'll, we'll be able to have some time with you still this evening. Yeah. Um, so with that, I just want to say, um, I think on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much for this conversation. And thank for you. Um, kind of opening up a little bit about your practice and your philosophy. Uh, but also thank you for what you're doing um, in terms of amplifying and and uh, bringing forward the voices of, of black artists. Uh, I think it's, it's tremendous, so thank you very much. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>So just a few housekeeping things for those who are interested. Um, on October 6th, so next week at 6 p.m., we are going to be hosting the seventh annual Stonecroft Foundation Visiting Artist Lecture featuring internationally renowned Canadian artist Stan Douglas. Stan Douglas' work is currently being featured at the Venice Biennale, uh, so really excited to be welcoming him here. And then on October 27th at 6.30 p.m., the gallery's senior curator of photographs, Andrea Cunard, will be fa facilitating a conversation with internationally recognized 
multidisciplinary artist Brendan Fernandez. His work is currently shown in uh, the movement exhibition. If you haven't caught it yet, um, it's there. So hope we see a lot of you back on those uh, few days. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we are going to move to the book signing. Um, um, and I'm just going to, from a housekeeping perspective, we're going to leave so we can get to the boutique. <laughs> um, and then uh, you will, we'll encourage you to head over that way. Um, and if you uh, haven't seen it, kind of in hardcover, um, this is As We Rise. It's a beautiful book. Um, and really thrilled that uh, we have it here in the boutique, but also that uh, we could maybe get you some signed copies as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Merci beaucoup pour être ici parmi nous ce soir. Uh, merci pour uh, cette discussion. Et on a très hâte de vous voir uh, bientôt. Merci. Have a very good evening. Yeah, merci beaucoup. beaucoup.